so today we have uh, two speakers, uh, Jeff Sampson uh, on Circular Logic and uh, Jeff Crowley, uh, Highland Galvanizers, um, who will be giving you some good insight to what's been going on in one or two of the areas of remanufacturing. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. So what I'll do is I'll just enable Jeff uh, Sampson and it's over to um, over to you, sir. So you should be able to unmute yourself now. Jeff Sampson, can you, Jeff Crawley, I also allowed it for yourself, but Jeff Sampson, are you able to unmute? Yeah, I'm, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> oh, so you just inform Catherine when you'd like it to be the, the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Um, you know, much appreciate the opportunity to talk about this project. Um, this received funding from Zero Waste Scotland through their Circular Economy Investment Fund. Um, and has been running for a couple of years and you know I'll, I'll talk you through what we've done um, and where we've got to so next slide please Catherine so a bit of background on the service um, you know what, what it set out to do you know very much consistent with the kind of topic of this week and these webinars you know it, it's been it's been a journey um, with, with plenty of twists and turns um, I guess underpinning that journey, the, the, the key aim was that I wanted to kind of explore something where, you, you know, we, we really had the underlying principle of re recycling being the last resort. Um, so looking at any opportunity to sort of focus on, you know, the waste hierarchy, reuse at the top, um, cascading down into opportunities to kind of repurpose, remanufacture before we consider what, what we do to, to recycle what might be left over. So I'll, I'll give you some kind of outputs on what we found out, um, current position around kind of R&D, um, uh, and I guess where this might take us next. Um, by way of kind of introduction, we'll, we'll run this, this video. Hopefully you'll be able to, to hear the sound as well. I can't hear the sound. I don't know if anyone else can. Sorry, we'll just have to unmute Catherine. Catherine, can you unmute, sorry? What we'll do is we'll, we'll circulate a link to, to the video to participants so they can hear. Um, so shall I pretend I'm, I'm the narrator? <laughs> yeah, please, yeah. please. So, so in essence, we're trying to say that um, <clears throat> the scheme is all about kind of helping people deal with kind of golf clubs that may have been left over in their garage. Um, and in essence, it, I guess it reflects a, a challenge that I felt in that, you know, I had plenty of golf clubs. I like golf. Um, but wasn't quite sure what to do with them to clear clear them out. Um, always felt there was potential for them to be reused and, and there's no real scheme out there that kind of enabled that to happen. So, you know, it is primarily a reuse scheme, but also looking at kind of repurposing and remanufacture, as we say there, um, working with kind of golf courses um, that sign up to the scheme. Um, been piloted in, in Scotland, primarily around Glasgow and Inverness, um, whilst we're kind of in that fact-finding stage. Next slide then, Catherine, please. So, 
as I say, I like golf. Um, you know, when I talk to people about the project and say, well, I'm running a circular economy project involving golf clubs, they, they typically look at me with some kind of bemusement. Um, I, I've always liked golf. I'm not particularly good at it, but even at school, I used to, whenever there was like a design or technology project, I'd always be involved in either designing a new golf course or some sort of, um, you know, equipment to do with golf. It's obviously ingrained in me somewhere. So maybe I missed my calling and, and ended up working in kind of the waste and resource sector. However, I've now that I work for myself, obviously had the opportunity to kind of meld those two together, which is, which has been great. Um, you know, a bit of background on kind of the golf sector and, and the focus here for me has really been on kind of products. Um, there are a lot of initiatives in the golf sector around improving its kind of sustainability performance with respect to kind of course management. So water management, use of pesticides, um, you know, trying to promote kind of conservation areas on, on golf courses. However, you know, I, I wanted to take a look at the equipment side of things because I thought there's actually a lot of scope for disruption. Um, you know, the majority of manufacturers seem very much focused on that kind of linear model. It's all about just selling new product, coming out with kind of, you know, a new model each, each year that claims to hit the ball a little bit further, a little bit straighter. It, invariably, you know, the, the technology and materials has kind of evolved quite significantly over time. Um, so now, you know, we see much more use of, of composites, complex composites. So, you know, whereas most golf clubs would have historically been made out of steel shafts, we now see a lot more lightweight graphite shafts and also kind of high value materials such as titanium in, in, in kind of the golf club heads. Um, the diagram you see here, I kind of developed with, with, with people I've been in discussions at the, the, the National Golf Foundation over in the US. And, and they do a lot of market research around kind of golfers' attitudes, um, both to kind of products and the game. And, and when we kind of concluded from that, that we think, you know, the current typical player and equipment sort of sits in this bottom left quadrant where, where you know, there isn't really much sustainability built in. There's very little kind of design for reuse. Um, it's always about trying to just get the next product um, sales focused, um, you know, perception around that brand as opposed to kind of anything that really embeds sustainability. Um, if you click the next slide, please, Catherine. So, so I think there's actually kind of quite a big challenge there to, to, to kind of go at. Um, scope for disruption, you know, look at different business models. Um, you, know, you know, part of the problem is, is probably the very dispersed supply chain. So whereas most of the big golf manufacturers, and you may have heard of kind of names like Ping, Callaway, Titleist, that, you know, they tend to be headquartered in the U.S., but the actual kind of supply chain of the materials, as you might imagine, comes from kind of like China and, and other countries in the Far East, um, you know, with, with assembly taking, taking place, at, you know, at different points in that chain. So golf clubs might be custom fitted. So you might have a different shaft added to a different club head, you know, at the point at which it goes out to the actual end user. So, so really there's, there's a lot to go at. Next slide, please. I won't go into the detail of this, but in setting up the scheme, um, I needed to kind of consider what the motivations of different parts of, of that handling chain would be. Um, you know, for any circular economy service, it needs to kind of be as good as, you know, whether that means it's easier, cheaper, um, more efficient than the equivalent or the do nothing to, to, to really stand a chance of being a success. So, you know, looking along the top, we're very much focused on what are the motivations of, of, of different stakeholders. Um, you know, the person who's got golf clubs now who maybe, you know, has bought a new set or has given up the game, you know, what are they going to do with them? You, you know, is it worth the hassle of, of trying to sell them on eBay or somewhere else? Um, you know, or are they just going to dispose of them at, at, at the recycling centre? Um, for golf courses, you know, they're looking to add member value. 
Um, you know, golf has been in decline over a number of years, albeit it's kind of experienced a bit of a renaissance during during COVID, um, a bit of an upturn. But you know, but longer term, it faces a challenge of trying to bring new new people in and and younger people and a more a more diverse kind of pl playing platform, as it were. We work in in delivering this scheme with the third sector. So so I work with an organisation called Blythewood Care. Um, who have got bases in it, you know, in various locations around Scotland, but that's why we've kind of focused on, on Inverness and, and Glasgow primarily. You know, they're always looking for other opportunities to kind of extend the work they do in terms of social benefit, um, obviously income as well. Um, and, and as you'll see at the end of this journey, we're, we're very much looking at developing new products. Um, and that introduces, you know, the need to, to be very much aware of, you know, what is that proposition and, and can this kind of recycled or repurposed product stack up against, you know, the competition, both in terms of kind of price, um, functionality uh, and obviously reliability. Next slide there, please, Catherine. Um, we've had to work, if you go back one, sorry, if you can. We've had to work with a, with a lot of organisations along the way. Um, you know, I, I work for myself. There's no way I could have done all this single handedly. You know, I wasn't out driving a van, picking up golf clubs every week for the last couple of years. Um, but, you know, I've had to kind of build a kind of partnerships, um, supply arrangements, both to do with kind of the logistics of, of handling the material, promoting the service. Um, developing supporting materials in the background, marketing, web development. So, you know, I, I guess part of the challenge was getting these people together, getting getting organisations on board and, and really seeing what could be achieved um, with, with what was a, a fairly relative sort of modest amount of funding. Next slide, Catherine. So just touch on a few of the kind of outputs today um, with, with, with some numbers behind them. Next slide. So in terms of what we kind of gathered, and it was a two year period over which kind of the pilot was formally funded and, and monitored, um, we, we took in over 6,000 clubs from, you know, a mix of courses that kind of came and, and left over that period. So, so we wanted, you know, a wide range of courses, some small, some large, some member based, some visitor based clubs in order to really gather, gather the evidence around, you know, w which kind of um, platform works best. You know, where do we get the best throughput of material? Next slide, please. Carbon is, is, is absolutely critical to this um, and was always a key metric. Um, and I think, you know, as context, um, you know, the, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has, has stated, you know, around our ambitions to address kind of the current climate crisis, that 45% that of, of kind of gains around emissions need to come from how we make and produce and manage products. So, you know, the, there's a significant amount of effort to, to try and disrupt some of these linear models and, in, and ensure that the resources that are going into them um, are being kind of, you know, prolonged and, and we're extending the life of products wherever possible. So we built a carbon model, um, which took account of, you know, all of those benefits along the supply chain. Most of those carbon benefits come from displacing the need for new products. You know, if we, if we can get clubs reused into kind of second, third, fourth kind of life phases, then, then that is really where that big carbon benefit comes from. Next slide, please. If you click again, please, we can bring up the points. Yeah, so, so reuse was really central to this. Um, you, you know, we, we wanted to get to a point where as much as possible that was coming through the door would be reallocated to, to new users. Um, you know, it's not without its challenges, as you might imagine. Um, so there's, there's a big disconnect between the fact that something may be reusable, but that doesn't necessarily mean it has any significant market value. Um, and golf clubs, are, you know, in particular, are a good example where, 
you, you've got, you know, certain brands, uh, obviously newer clubs will hold on to value much better than others. Um, and that value quickly drops off. And we've also got the problem that, that golfers tend to be quite fussy fairly quickly. You, you know, once they've started picking up the game, they want kind of, you know, a, a set of clubs that, that will help them progress. Um, there's a lot of variability in golf clubs which means there's a lot of time and effort required to kind of sort through them um, and try and get, you know, the, the right product to the right market. So we've got a number of channels. So working with Blytheswood, you know, a, a decent chunk of clubs go out through their, their retail shops. Um, we will also sell online um, on, on eBay, for example. And, and part of that is to kind of gather information around that, that market value that these products have. Um, and, and also, you know, I've had to reach out through the likes of LinkedIn and other networks in, in order to try and get clubs out, you know, say, for example, to schools. So I was able to set a couple of half junior sets a couple of weeks ago to a junior school that, that were keen to get their kids at least try trying the game. So, so these challenges aren't unique to golf clubs. And I think, you know, we need to be looking at this in the context of, of, of trying to break down some of those barriers to reuse um, and ensuring that you know we're, we're meeting some of the potential. I mean over 10 years ago RAP did a study that said for UK households that reuse had the potential to deliver a million tonnes of CO2 savings per annum and that was over a 10-year window. And I suspect that things haven't, you know, significantly moved forward from, from that point until now. But it, it really is a kind of a central pillar of the circular economy and, and, and needs, needs to be supported. Next slide, please. So going back to the point around kind of recycling being our last resort, the reality is that not every club that comes through, you know, we can find a, a viable market for. So our focus quickly turned to, you know, which elements of golf clubs cause us a problem in, in terms of actually getting, um, you, you know, that material repurposed um, because there's limited opportunities for, for recycling. Um, next slide, please. So we've kind of embarked on, on a sort of process of product development and the, the, the focus of that has been very much around graphite shafts. As I said, graphite has kind of taken over to, to a large extent from steel, especially for kind of um, sort of clubs for, for beginners or improving players because it's very lightweight. Um, you know, it has great strength properties, um, clearly rust resistant, so long lasting. Um, and easy to kind of configure with, with different kind of flex properties. However, not easy to recycle. There's no real commercially viable route for, for recycling kind of these sort of high value graphite carbon fiber based products. So the guiding principle for us was, you know, we wanted to focus on that and embed those components. We didn't want to look at recycling. We wanted to kind of repurpose the shafts as they are, um, you know, to cut down on, on the additional energy and time and cost uh, and very much focused on, on sort of agile development. So everything we've done to date has been through kind of 3D printing um, and, and, and underpinning. We wanted then to produce a next phase of products that, that are easy to, to repair or refurbish. Um, so we've tried to move away from kind of gluing components together. So we would have kind of push fit or, or, or kind of nuts and bolts wherever possible. And we've had to create kind of a, a brand and a platform in, in order to, to, to push those, those new products through. Hopefully I'll be able to play a, um, a, a short video now that tells a bit of a story around the first product that I've taken to market. This normally would have some backing music, but um, it tells the story in the words and the pictures.
that was a rather ambitious um, first concept. Um, we've we've kind of moderated ourselves a little bit away from that. Here you can see kind of 3D printing. This is using um, recycled plastics. So this first product is effectively a kind of a little chipping target. Um, you know, it utilizes three um, graphite shafts to create kind of the, the, the tripod, um, but collapses down and, and kind of folds up much like an umbrella. Um, there's a couple of different configurations, you know, bright colours, again, hopefully to sort of encourage use with kind of academies and children. Um, and, you, you know, we're, we're in the process of trying to promote that now and, and, and move it forward and take it to market. Next slide, please. And next slide. So, so the next kind of product that um, I'm working on is a, a, a kind of a repurposed litter picker. Um, again, you know, we're trying to keep things simple, um, focus on repurposing those key components. Um, so here you'd have the graphite shafts with, with the grips retained, you know, anything that can reduce the time and effort on our side. Um, obviously kind of improves the cost effectiveness of, of getting the price point down of, of such products. Um, and also kind of in the design, you know, we, we want the components to be as simple as possible. So mirror images of hinges um, and, and kind of the, the, the collectors at the end of this. So it would be spring loaded product. Um, and very much, you know, that has taken me into the realm of having to kind of talk to I guess enablers and, 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 and people who would help us get these products to market. So you, you see a quote there from the Two Minute Foundation. Um, so you may have heard of them. They, they kind of promote beach cleaning exercises and have set up these kind of um, stations where, where there will be information around kind of litter and a litter picker, you know, encouraging people just to spend two minutes, um, you know, clearing the area that they are. They are. Uh, and I guess the sort of next step that we're also interested in is whether we can combine this sort of product with with like a walking pole design, at which point we then start to talk with kind of, you know, walking clubs um, uh, and, other, and other community groups that help can kind of get this product to market. Next slide, please. So hopefully that gives you a taste for kind of what I've done. Um, you know, over, over the last sort of six to nine months, as you might appreciate, things have somewhat been put on hold. The, the, the scheme is still operating with a number of clubs, but we're very much at the point of, you know, how, how do we scale this now? You know, what, what's the business model? It needs to stack up commercially for it to be kind of taken forwards. But, but I think overall the conclusions are, you know, there's no shortage of, of golf clubs out there that are sat, you know, in, in sheds, garages, lofts, whatever, um, you know, many of which, you know, are reusable, but, but potentially don't have a great deal of market value. Um, and, and we need to sort of look at how to scale um, and be able to kind of make use of, of that resource um, to, to make things cost effective. You know, for example, there's a lot of titanium um within the sort of newer clubs but unfortunately you know, it's bound up with kind of plastics and composites so you know not not easy to extract and get to um as i say reuse it, it's in my experience has been you know labor intensive um and and the, the the great level of kind of product variation and lack of sort of standardization you know it is challenging you know, if all clubs were the same, life would be easier. But, you know, I've had to deal with shafts of different lengths. I've found manufacturers who will kind of introduce innovations and suddenly produce a, a fatter shaft. Now, obviously, that doesn't help me trying to kind of repurpose them into a, into a new product. And I think, you know, there's this real tension between innovation, you know, where brands have, have always looked to kind of tweak their own designs so they can make them stand out but that doesn't necessarily align well with kind of the circular economy principle which really would like more standardization to make it much easier to kind of disassemble to repair to refurbish to upgrade 
and 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 I guess that that sort of commercial viability is is really dependent on you know how do we get these repurposed products competing on a level playing field you know when you take into account all the effort that I've had to put into repurposing something and yet you can buy you know a competing product at a ridiculously low low price you know that, that invariably has come from China it, it, it's just difficult so you know until kind of these um sort of linear products are priced to include some of their kind of long-term impacts or their externalities it, re it really is a challenge you know we're looking at how to engage the manufacturers in this you know with their sort of voluntary pr or, or other business models so you know could, could clubs be leased as a way of kind of tying customers in it's almost like a club for life concept and they would be refit each year to make sure they've kind of got the, the most appropriate club for their game but it would keep those clubs in kind of the control and circulation of the manufacturer as i say the dispersed supply chains sort of make that difficult we've looked at scheme sponsorship whether you know on a regional basis the front end collection might might be sponsored um in order to to, to make that you know more commercially viable for us the back end products is, has obviously brought me into kind of the need for, for much slicker marketing. Um, so, you know, really you need to be working with kind of influencers, opinion leaders, you know, and in, in intermediaries to, to get these products to market, which, you know, I'd struggle to do on my own. And then I guess kind of underpinning all of that, you know, there, there is need for, for, for better policy support around kind of whether it be carbon pricing or tax tax breaks. Um, and I think, you know, recognition of the social value of these types of schemes and, and what they bring. So, so that's it. Thank you for listening. Um, and happy to take any questions at the end, if time allows. Thanks, Jeff. That's, that's been a really good presentation. Always good to see the progress that you're making. And uh, I know we've had some good talks at various events about the, the progress in your program, but it's... Uh, in a, a golf love for myself it's it's fascinating um so what we'll do is we'll hold off on questions uh until the second speakers uh had theirs but please do use the uh, the q a box to raise any questions that you you might have um and also if you do wish to get in touch with the speakers after we're, we're happy to do any introduction um for, for yourselves um if, if required um so if i could just prompt jeff uh, samson to mute please and then jeff uh, crawley you should be um, able to to talk now we'll just check yes. that brilliant thank you um so so jeff over to yourself that's brilliant okay so now for something completely different as they say um here we move from something that everybody sees um, quite often and can recognize golf clubs to something that you see but don't see all along the motorway and a lot of trunk roads, there is a vehicle restraint system. We often think of this as being a crash barrier, and that's the perhaps the uh, ordinary layman's word for it, but uh, the people that are responsible for roads don't like to call it that because they don't like to think of crashes. They call it a vehicle restraint system. In fact, they're there to try and avoid a crash and to keep traffic on the road rather than have it leaping the center uh, barrier and that sort of thing. Next slide, please. So uh, this is the sort of stuff you've uh, driven along the motorway. Here we are on the M9 heading eastbound. Uh, and on your left, left of that black car in the foreground, you can see this sort of barrier. And you notice that particular one, it's, it's uh, uh, the coating, the protective coating, the galvanizing on it, that silvery colored uh, stuff that's there when it's new, is just about gone. Our business as a, as a company is galvanizing steel. And the reason to galvanize steel is because it turns to dust and rust uh, unless we do something to protect it or to, pre to prevent that chemical reaction that takes place just naturally. In other words, steel will deteriorate unless we do something active to prevent it. So the motorway crash barrier or the VRS as they call it, vehicle restraint system is uh, made of steel and it's galvanized to start with and that gives it good corrosion protection for perhaps 30 or 40 years. But that time soon goes by and eventually it starts to go brown like this and then when it starts to go brown very rapidly it deteriorates and becomes perforated and just turns crumbles away to dust and of course then it's not mechanically stable it doesn't do the job that it was designed to do 
And what happens is when it gets to the stage of this picture, it's typically um, scrapped. When I say scrapped, uh, I mean that it is actually recycled. It's not uh, just buried in the ground. They take this and sell it to scrap dealers who deal in scrap metals and it gets melted down uh, and made into other things uh, out of steel. What's the next slide please. This coating is a, is a um, coating that uh, is typically about 60 or 70, 80 microns, that's thousands of a, of a millimeter thick when it's new like this. Uh, and here we, here we can see a meter, a very simple sort of meter that measures the thickness of this non-ferrous non coating, the zinc coating on top of the ferrous steel substrate. So we can measure this at any stage of its life. And by measuring a deteriorating or a depleting coating, we can then extrapolate that and predict its life. So we can we could measure the, the VRS along the motorway, measure the thickness of the coating and say, that that bit of steel is likely to need changing out in this year or that year, whatever. Next slide. How Transport Scotland, which is the Scottish government's authority to deal with uh, main roads, trunk roads and motorways work is that they split the country into four areas. Uh, and so we dealt with the, the uh, southeast area where there is 417 kilometers of this VRS beam. Uh, and 85% of it is of the, of the type that we're talking about. So there was quite a bit of scope in this southeast area. Uh, at that stage, it was run by their contractor called Amy. They've had a shuffle around with contractors and Bear are now responsible for this. And Amy have moved to the west coast where Bear used to be. But that's by the by. Um, so we just dealt with a quarter of the, of the VRS in Scotland to start with. And we started working with Transport Scotland and this one particular contractor to say, we could do something to regalvanize this material. Instead of remelting it when, it, uh, when the coating uh, is de fully depleted, we can take it away at that stage and regalvanize it, put a new coating on it. Next slide. So the proposition is instead of scrapping the steel, let's regalvanize it. And that's quite common with all sorts of other things. We don't build a new house. Uh, if you had a timber house, say, you don't build a new one just because the paint is worn out, you would repaint it. Uh, and lots of other things like that where a coating is put on to protect something, then the coating can be replaced instead of replacing the item. So this is, the, this is perhaps the ultimate in terms of reuse. It's reuse for exactly the same purpose. Next slide. There are some benefits in doing this. Firstly, that the safety performance of the asset, the, the barrier along the side of the road is maintained. Uh, so it, if you let it start going rusty, then the safety performance deteriorates. And sad to say, because there hasn't been enough money perhaps or whatever, there are some safety barriers along the side of the road that are not fit for purpose. It meets government demands and pressure. The government is putting demand and pressure on their departments, such as Transport Scotland and others to get their costs down and get their environmental performance up. So here's a way that they can reduce cost uh, and can uh, do something to improve their uh, environmental performance. It has an improved public perception too. Uh, brown rusty steel along the side of the road doesn't look great. And most people would say that probably isn't any good. It's a bit innovative. It's not something that had been thought of before. And in fact, it was quite, uh, quite a lot of resistance to it in the first place along the lines of, well, we've never thought of doing that before. Uh, therefore, it can't be a good idea. Not very good thinking that, but uh, eventually you can break through that. Quicker supply is another benefit. Instead of having to order and wait for somebody to make some of this material, we can reprocess it in a few days. And this has a lower carbon footprint, and I'll come back to that. Next slide. It's pretty easy to unassemble or disassemble this material along the side of the road. It's all bolted together. So it's just a case of going along and unbolting it in this picture. It's a flash picture taken at night because most of this work is done at night on the motorways. Uh, and that's why it looks a bit strange, the picture. Uh, next slide. So we take this stuff apart take it off its posts and take the beams one from another. Uh, and, they, and they look very used at this stage. 
But remember, this is at the end of its life as life was expected to be. And what would normally be the disposition of this is to send it to a scrap dealer and sell it as scrap steel. Next slide. We take it to a factory. We have two sites in Scotland. Uh, there are four galvanizing plants. We have two of them. Uh, and these galvanizing plants just process ton after ton of various fabricated steel items. But it's a factory process, you can't do it out on the site. Uh, and in fact, Transport Scotland don't really want people working on the motorways if they can avoid it. Some things obviously have to be done there, but not processes. The process is simple. You start with cleaning it. You can see that it was uh, covered in various dirt and rubbish. Um, and we call it fluxing. It's dipping it in various chemicals. And then we ultimately dip it in zinc. And the bottom right picture is a picture of uh, a guy standing behind there controlling a crane with a, a beam with a whole lot of um, pieces of steel suspended on wires immersed in molten zinc and it's coming out of that zinc. After it comes out of the zinc we cool it, uh, another chemical process on top of that and then dispatch it, it's finished. The whole process takes a few hours. The coating is metallurgically bonded to the steel. Uh, it's an alloying process and it's done to an international standard. Next slide. We do some inspection on it after that, just to make sure that everything is in fact right. We can measure the thickness of the coating and make sure that the thickness of the steel was okay. In fact, we do that beforehand. Uh, and so some uh, inspection and next. And put a stamp on it so that we know who did what when and so uh, we're, we're stamping these uh, items afterwards, so an indelible stamp, so that later on in 20 or 30 years time, we can say this one's already gone around the circuit once, uh, and here we are, we're regalvanizing it again. In theory, this could be done many times with perhaps a 30 year life each time. Next slide. Putting the benefits into some numbers uh, and uh, other th thoughts here. Firstly, availability. Currently in Scotland, uh, there's not much stock of this material kept here. When uh, a, a section of motorway needs new beam erected, then they order it in advance and they have to wait for it to, to come. Regalvanizing costs somewhere between 40 and 50% of the new beam, depending on the particular type of beam. But uh, really attractive is the lower CO2 footprint. It's an 89% reduction in carbon dioxide. And where that big reduction is, is the difference in making new steel versus recoating old steel. And this is in line with government objectives of uh, uh, introducing circular economy concepts to things that their departments are doing. Next slide. In the southeast area of Scotland, remember that uh, map that I showed you, just the southeast area, this would save £587,000 a year, saving 2,000 tonnes of CO2, and it would ease the supply timing that apparently at the moment is a problem. So this is the saving that could be achieved in southeast Scotland every year if they did all of this material in this way. Now, clearly not all of it is recyclable. Sometimes it gets bent. People do actually bang into this stuff with their cars and vehicles. Uh, and some of it doesn't get recycled this way or reused. Uh, but about 96 or 7% of it could be. And these are the numbers for that percentage uh, yield. Next slide. If we extrapolate this, now extrapolation is always a bit dangerous, but here just roughly multiplying by four, um, then we could save 2.3, nearly 2.4 million pounds a year. That's a saving to the government in effect. It's to Transport Scotland, one of their agencies. Uh, and that means in effect to the taxpayer. We could save 8,000 tons of CO2. And for us as a company, it's 1,000 tons of work. Now we typically do about 17, 18, 19,000 tons, nearly 20,000 tons. So we're talking about um, coming up towards 5% of our production. Uh, we could have an extension. In other words, we found a new market without finding a new manufacturer. Next slide. There's a difficulty in establishing this sort of change. And for us, we found some quite a few difficulties. We just heard of difficulties in getting people to think about recycling golf clubs. It's no different getting government departments to think about reuse and introducing circular economy principles to the likes of something as mundane as a crash barrier along the side of the road. It requires some effort to change the system. We've always done it this way. Who are you to come along and interrupt and upset the apple cart and introduce a new method? That's just a pain in the neck. Then there's uh, excuses like 
Oh, yes, but the, that new stuff meets all the quality standards and so on. W will this regalvanizing process affect the strength, the mechanical integrity of that material? Uh, and that upsets the existing supply chain. There is somebody making this stuff. Incidentally, about um, 70 or 80 percent of this stuff is made in the UK out of European steel, and the rest is imported from the United States. So that uh, fairly ordinary looking bit of steel that you see along the motorway, it's amazing to think that sometimes that's imported from as far as the United States uh, just to, to build on the side of the motorway. Next slide. Here's the history of this project and it starts quite a long time ago. In 1997, we floated this idea with the Scottish office. This was before there was a Scottish government uh, and it just got shot down in flames and, and just rested in, in a few people's mind as, as a possibility to be raised later on when, when there might be a more receptive mood for it. And it wasn't until the 2000s, 2014, that we got um, the just established Scottish Institute of Remanufacturing to look at this uh, and to help us to verify that our process wouldn't affect the mechanical integrity of the piece of steel. That piece of steel is rated to take an impact of certain size of a truck at a certain speed, at a certain angle and all these sorts of things. So it's built to a, quite a, a stringent set of standards. And we raised this again in 2015 with Transport Scotland after we had uh, help with proving that we hadn't ruined the piece of steel by our process, that in fact it had exactly the same properties uh, as it had before. And by 2017, we had the first trial on the M9 motorway, 2018, a second trial, uh, 2018, some more testing was done. And then um, we had to write a standard uh, and a procedure for Transport Scotland because they said, well, we don't have any procedures or any means of, of being able to uh, use this uh, so-called secondhand material. Now we tried to get away from the thought of secondhand. It's not secondhand, it's firsthand. You owned it before, you own it now. It doesn't change hands here. It's just you doing some maintenance on this piece of steel. So we wrote a specification in 2018 for remanufactured vehicle restraint system. And then the third and larger project in 2019 was a, a process of 25 tons was processed. And then this year we've had the interruption of this virus. Next slide. Some lessons that we've learned about this uh, from this whole process has been to look at the problem from their viewpoint as well as our own. We saw it as work for us. That was our primary objective. A secondary objective was from the good of society to say, and it's a whole lot better to save that CO2 and to use these circular economy principles. But that wasn't good enough for our customer, and our customer in this case is effectively the government through their agency, Transport Scotland. So we had to do a bit of homework here and figure out, so what is it they really want? And we also had to find an internal champion in the customer's business, somebody there that was receptive to this thought. And we found that and that was, that was useful. Uh, but we had to restate the advantages to the customer. Now, I mentioned that we could be saving a couple of million pounds a year, every year, by, uh, by regalvanizing VRS steel. But that wasn't particularly interesting. It just didn't seem to excite anybody. But when we restated that and said, would you like to save 8,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide a year, then suddenly there was a lot of different interest. And that's probably because different people are motivated by different things in their different areas of business or government. Uh, and government departments, perhaps it's sad to say, but perhaps they're not quite so concentrated on the money side of things, that they have to have some concentration on it. But um, whatever, the, whatever their master, the Scottish government in this case, puts the pressure on, then that's what gets done. So if they say, get your carbon footprint down, then, and we come along and say, here's a way of saving carbon dioxide, then that starts to become exciting. And that's what I mean by looking at it from their viewpoint as well as our own. And the last point that we've learned in this is that you have to be persistent. You can see that uh, to start something in, in uh, 1997 and even now, we're just really starting to get into doing the business. Um, quite a few years later, what's that, about 25 years later or something, then um, it's taken us a long time, but we need to be persistent, but not a nuisance. If we were a real nuisance to them, I think we would have been kicked out the door and, 
wouldn't get any reception at all. But if we did nothing, then nothing would happen. So somewhere between the extremes of doing nothing and being a pest uh, is the right uh, pitch point to keep the pressure pressure on to achieve this. So for us, we've uh, found in effect a new customer with a reasonable amount of work. We've found a way to save the government some money. And as taxpayers, all of us, we're very pleased about that point. Uh, we found a way to contribute to a circular economy project that is really dead simple when you think about it, but nobody really had thought about it before. Quite a lot of background work in doing the research to figure out that, uh, to, to disprove the thoughts that people would have to say, here's why you can't do that. So we had to dismantle all those, no, you can't do it because thought, sort of thoughts. So where people thought that we couldn't do it because it would affect the mechanical integrity, we disproved that. Where people said, well, you can't do it because the standards don't allow that, then we had to write new standards. You can't do it because it, uh, we don't have procedures for that, so we need to write new procedures. And you have to work through all of these things. And there's a persistence required in that. I think that's the last slide. Okay, so um, thank you for that. That's, a, that's about Highland galvanizers and regalvanizing vehicle restraint systems, this steelwork that you see all along the side of the, the motorway. Thanks. Th thanks, Jeff. That, that was really good. Um, so now we're hitting our, um, our, our Q&A session. So please, please um, start writing your, your questions in either the, uh, the chat box or the, the Q&A. Um, Jeff uh, Crawley, I've, I've actually got a question for you just to kick things off. So I'm, I'm always interested in exact programs uh, that, that you've kind of undertaken in terms of um, utilising existing infrastructure that really all that's happened is kind of a, an initial aesthetic surface kind of a, erosion. Um, in terms of kind of life cycle and um, disruption for supply chain, how much of kind of the, the core substrate material do we actually process and produce in country are we predominantly dependent on a, an external market to provide those actual barrier panels? Well, those um, barrier beams, which are all pretty much the same, um, they are, there's a company in, in the Midlands who make them, uh, and they make most of that material for the UK, but there is a reasonable size proportion is imported mostly from the United States. Why the United States, I don't know, but um, the steel that it is made from is... Um, not mostly made in the UK, it's mostly imported from Europe. So we're importing steel from Europe, uh, bending it into that shape, galvanizing it in the Midlands, and then distributing it in the UK. So Scotland doesn't produce any of this, we import it from uh, the rest of the UK, and that in turn has imported components from various places. Brilliant, thanks Jeff, that's, that's a great answer. So I've got a, a question for both of you. Um, so what, what do you think needs to happen, e.g. in terms of uh, tax rebalancing, I suppose incentivization as well could be put in there, uh, to make the circular economy more financially viable? I think that's a Shall good I... question. Shall I go first? And, yeah, you go first, Jeff. Uh, I think that society is no different to people in government. I've just mentioned that government people are, are sometimes difficult to get moving in this sort of area. Everybody needs a push in some way or other. And uh, a financial push, however that's engineered, a financial push certainly tends to uh, make things happen more easily. So and my, my, my way of thinking is that I don't care whether it's a tax or a, or a disincentive tax or a whatever it might be. Uh, probably it's financial, partly regulatory, but somewhere there needs to be a government instituted push to make things happen. Otherwise, people will carry on doing what they've always done. And we all know that that is a downward slope to disaster. Over to you, Jeff. I would very much echo that point. Um, you know, we are starting to see things such as the you know, plastic tax proposals, um, starting to see EPR, extended producer responsibility, kind of emerging around things such as packaging. But, you know, in my mind, EPR should apply to every product that's placed on the market. You know, if if, if, if brands are able to put onto the market, you know, products for which there's no viable, you know, end of life route, you know, whether that be recycling, but preferably, you know, extension of life, then they should be contributing something towards that. 
um, you know, because that's going to then start to drive them to think about, you know, d design of their product with, with end of life in mind. Um, you know, I guess other things, as I alluded to on the final slide, if, if there was a VAT um, benefit for products that met sustainability criteria, then obviously that would have a small, a small impact in, in helping to make, you know, my, my repurposed products a little bit more kind of competitive on, on cost grounds. So, so on that on that kind of response, I'd be interested from um, both of you, and it kind of links into one of the questions that was mainly focused on golf, but I think it's relevant for both. And that is, you know, is there an education, you know, an educational piece here um, for either the the youth to develop the the opportunity, um, but also for for the industry as well to help that that rewire from a, a linear to more sustainable approach. Do you think that's still still needed or do you think it's there, but it's just not, not incentivized enough, not motivated enough? I mean, from my side, invariably, if, if customers start to kind of ask these questions and, you know, to demand that, that something's put in place, then, you know, the, the manufacturers, the brands will start to listen. Um, you know, at this point, um, we're just trying to kind of lobby those brands and get them to think about different business models. But invariably, you know, they've survived very nicely for many years, you know, based on that just linear business model. So it's going to take something to kind of make them take that leap of faith to, to explore something different. So uh, I'm just hoping it's not kind of 25 years as per um, Jeff's experience. I think that's right, that there has to be some sort of push somewhere. Uh, and now the push can be push or pull, I suppose. But inherently, we, we all have a lazy streak within us and we get comfortable in our little uh, niche of uh, wherever we are doing what we're doing. Uh, and unless something disrupts that or unless something makes it uh, irritates us or, or causes discomfort, then there isn't a lot of incentive to change things. So if we've always taken uh, five plastic bags from the supermarket to put our shopping in and we've always chucked them in the rubbish when we got home or let them blow around the countryside, then that's how it will continue. And so we use millions and millions of those plastic bags. So it had to bring about something that, that causes, you know, there, there had to be some incentive to change behavior. Uh, and the tax on those plastic bags made a big difference. Um, perhaps then people will get used to that and another another uh, ratchet up of the of the motivation is necessary but um, I, I think that that's true with business as well if, if people have learned to uh, survive at the expense of the environment then uh, we have to we have to change people's thinking of that and if that that requires a, a big push typically the pushes have to be instituted by government. I don't think they'll be instituted just by small companies like us or by Jeff there, that we can, we can introduce things, but we can't force people to do it. Uh, and I'm not saying that we should force everybody to uh, uh, embrace the circular economy, but we need to make it uncomfortable not to, because the long term is going to be so uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm conscious of time, so I'll ask e each one um, a, a direct question on, on your topic area. So, uh, Jeff uh, Samson, um, you've mentioned that the, the interest in golf has basically been declining. So do you think um, the, the model that you've kind of developed is sustainable or suitable to be translated to other sports or leisure activities or equipment? Um, you are definitely, yes. Um, you know, many sports in terms of equipment have, have followed similar kind of trajectories to golf, you know, in terms of the introduction of, of more complex composites. Um, so invariably, you know, you, we've got a legacy of, of products out there and that are still being manufactured today that, you know, are going to cause us problems further down the line. Um, mm -hmm. but, but unless we can kind of, you know, enact some of the things we've just talked about in the last few minutes around engaging the manufacturers and or putting in place the systems to be able to recover and recycle those, then, you know, I guess the concern is that it's, it's, it's quite a long pathway to, until kind of the products are being designed in the way we want them to be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one for Jeff uh, Crawley. So given your long journey and what you know now, 
Um, is there a process or approach you would now take to try to, to shorten and get to that end result more, more quickly? Or do you think that that opportunity has come around due to more awareness of circular economy and the, the climate change crisis? Yeah, I think there's two climates to consider here. One is the climate change that we all talk about and understand, but there's also uh, a sort of a climate of understanding of this process. When I mentioned that in 1997, I took this to the Scottish office, there was no climate for remanufacturing. That word hadn't really been thought of much then. Uh, recycling, there was a bit of that going on, but not much, but it wasn't something, it was only where the, the raw material had a great value. Uh, so there has to be two climates. There has to be a climate for change as well as the climate that is changing, whether we change or not with it. And so would we do something differently to condense that? I don't think so. Probably it just takes that long to do certain things, but uh, everything's different and everything has its own opportunity and its own pathway that is required to get there. Whether there's a regulatory framework to fit within or an economic framework to fit within or whatever it be, I think each one you just have to explore along it and hack your way through the jungle. I like that, hack your way through the jungle, completely agree with that. Um, brilliant, so uh, thank you once again um, to both our speakers, very, very outstanding presentations I think to give a good insight to the challenges uh, facing companies in, in trying to enter this market but also some of the, the barriers that still exist. Um, also, thank you to the participants for, for signing up to the webinar. Um, please check out our, our website. We've got a newly launched uh, website. Please do come back with feedback because we're looking for um, new topic ideas or areas of interest to uh, conduct other webinars during this time. Um, and I, I hope you have a, a good remaining weekend. Enjoy the weekend once it comes. And um, Jeff and Jeff, thank you once again for very good presentations. Thank you. And we'll leave it there. Good day all.